Well, hello and welcome to Patient Safety Culture, a Foundation for Equality program, an exclusive webinar with Tina Hilmes, Project Manager at the Center for Patient Safety, and a joint presentation with the Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign. Uh, we're so pleased that you could join us this afternoon uh, for today's presentation. And as far as objectives go, uh, during the next hour, you will learn to understand the basic foundation of patient safety and recommendations for moving forward. We're also going to be able to identify two dimensions within an organizational that uh, survey on patient safety or the SOPS can measure, as well as recognize how safety culture aligns with quality program standards and identify two approaches to safety culture. Uh, today's presentation has been approved for 1.5 nursing CEs by the Alabama State Nurses Association. Alabama State Nurses Association is accredited as an approved for uh, continuing education provider through the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. Many of you are listening now through your computer speakers or you may have dialed in on the telephone, uh, but please be advised that we will be taking questions throughout today's webinar uh, using the Q&A feature in WebEx. So if you have a question uh, for any of us or for our keynote speaker, uh, please feel free to send it through the Q&A anytime and after the keynote presentation, uh, we'll get to as many questions as time will allow. Uh, so before we get to Tina Hilmes, it is my great pleasure to introduce Cynthia Pammon, who is the subject matter expert for HHQI uh, with the Center for uh, Clinical Quality, uh, Clinical Standards and Quality, Quality Improvement Group at Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Cynthia? Hello, everyone. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and I would love to welcome you to the patient safety webinar today. Often we hear about patient safety issues and adverse events within the hospital setting, but now is the time to create proactive plans and develop a patient safety culture within the home health setting. I hope you will find value in the webinar today to assist with these efforts. And I certainly thank you for your time and attention today. I will turn it back over to Christo and our speaker. Well, thank you so much, uh, Cynthia, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are going to listen to a, a presentation, and Tina Hilmes is joining us. Tina is a project manager at the Center for Patient Safety, a patient uh, safety organization, or PSO, and she brings a diverse nursing background to the center. Uh, she's spent well over 20 years in, nurse, in the nursing profession, uh, both within the hospital walls and outside in the home care arena. Uh, she has spent the first decade of her career working in the neonatal intensive care unit at places such as Nationwide Children's Hospital and the University of Michigan. She then spent some time as a school nurse and served as adjunct faculty in an AD nursing program before turning her attention to the home care arena, uh, where she has spent more than 10 years in operations and quality improvement. She first developed a passion for patient safety when working in the NICU. Uh, this passion continued as she transitioned into home care and she was able to see firsthand how patient safety was affected by the transition of uh, the patient from the hospital to the home environment. Her work includes collaborating on quality improvement projects that include incorporating a strong patient safety culture. Uh, she also reviews patient safety events uh, reported to the center uh, just to analyze for trends and, and causal factors to assist organization, uh, organizations with the changing uh, in their culture and improving patient safety. Ms. Hilmes ho holds a Bachelor of uh, Science degree in nursing from The Ohio State University and is currently finishing her master's degree at the University of Missouri in health informatics. She is certified uh, as in just culture as a trainer and also a master trainer in team steps and has experience with helping organizations to implement CUSP, C-U-S-P, which she'll go over during the presentation. She is a member of the ANA and also the American Society of Professionals and Patient Safety. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Tina Hilmes. Tina? Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, 
As mentioned, I do work at the Center for Patient Safety, and I'm extremely excited to be here discussing patient safety with you all. This program will be divided into four different topic areas. I will begin by explaining who the Center for Patient Safety is and what we do as a patient safety organization. Then we will delve into the foundation of patient safety culture, how it came about, and I will highlight some recent reports. I will also introduce you to a tool for measuring patient safety culture and highlight the benefits of a strong culture and also some barriers to implementing patient safety culture. That will lead us into how QAPI and patient safety culture align with one another. And then lastly, I will introduce you to a few different approaches to safety culture, such as team steps, CUSP, and also a program called Second Victims. But before we begin talking about patient safety culture, we need to address the topic of patient safety. I want to share with you a story of an event that occurred in a leading hospital. Josie King was an 18-month-old child who was admitted to the hospital after suffering severe burns from climbing into a hot bath. Within two weeks, she healed and was set to be discharged home. However, Josie died just days before she was to be released. We ask, how could this happen? It was a series of events. After leaving the pediatric ICU, Josie's central line was removed. Every time she saw a drink, she screamed for it. She was sucking feverishly at a wet washcloth. Josie's mother asked the nurses about this, and she was assured it was normal, even though it was something Josie had never done before. Josie's mom had been with her 18-month-old daughter every minute from the day she entered the hospital, and the nurses suggested maybe it was time for Mrs. King to sleep at home. Arriving back at the hospital the next morning at 5 a.m., Josie's mother knew something was drastically wrong. The medical team was called, and they immediately administered Narcan. Afterwards, Josie's mom asked if she could give her daughter something to drink and was given the go-ahead. Josie gulped down a liter of juice. Verbal orders were given at that time, no more narcotics. Josie seemed to improve. But at 1 o'clock, a nurse entered with, with a syringe of methadone. Josie's mom told her there had been an order given for no more narcotics. The nurse responded, saying that the order had been changed and gave Josie the injection of methadone. Soon after, Josie's heart stopped. Her mother was ushered out of the room, and the next time she saw Josie, she was back in the pediatric ICU. She was hooked up to multiple monitors and looked awful. 18-month-old Josie King died in her mother's arms two days later. She had a hospital-acquired infection, was severely dehydrated, and had been given inappropriate narcotics. I know many of you may be thinking that this type of event could never happen in your organization, or maybe you're thinking, that's a hospital event, that's not home health. However, I'm also certain many of you have either experienced or witnessed an unexpected outcome, whether it was a patient who developed an infection from a PICC line or a UTI from a Foley catheter or a Superpuvit catheter or suffered a medication error. Let's take a moment and ponder those experiences and think of areas where patient safety could be improved within your organization. So on to what are patient safety organizations? Let's look back several years as patient safety and quality became more of a priority in healthcare. To help improve patient safety and quality of care, the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act, or the PSQIA, you will hear it called, was signed into law in July of 2005, with the final federal regulations coming down in 2009. The primary intent of the PSQIA is to learn about mistakes, be proactive in preventing them, to reduce the cost of healthcare as a result of medical errors, and to decrease harm to patients. Patient safety organizations, or PSOs, as we are called, were developed as a result of this act. Our primary mission is to conduct activities to improve patient safety and the quality of healthcare. PSOs can provide a secure environment for the sharing of information due to federal protection that was provided as a result of the PSQIA. So why PSOs? Well, 
The truth is, just like the Titanic only saw about 10% of the iceberg that destroyed it and never saw the remaining 90% under the water, most organizations truly do not know how many adverse events, near misses, or unsafe conditions occur on a daily basis. This is true across the continuum of care from hospitals to ASCs, doctor's offices, home health, hospice, and every healthcare arena. There is also very little education or training in regards to patient safety. Even going back to nursing school curriculum or orientation within your own organization, patient safety has taken a back seat. Especially now with the nursing shortage, it has become almost a necessary evil in many organizations to cut back on orientation time so that the organization will have staff for their patients. So education that may help prevent patient events is cut out of the orientation process. And lastly, safety data is fragmented. Some events are reported, some are not. And within a single organization, it may be difficult to try and find or see a trend or even tips for putting in a best practice. Because PSOs collect data across multiple organizations, we are able to look at an increased number of events and not only try to find common causal factors, but also reach out to organizations that have implemented an improvement process and share their best practices with other PSO participants. So who is the Center for Patient Safety? We are an independent, not-for-profit, patient safety organization that was established in 2005. We were created to serve as a hub for collaboration among stakeholders to improve the safety of care. We became one of the first federally listed PSOs in November of 2008. We work to provide solutions and resources to improve patient safety and quality of healthcare delivery across the continuum of care. We work with health systems, hospitals, EMS providers, medical offices, ASCs, long-term care facilities, home health, and hospice providers. We work with providers across the United States. We are currently in 38 different states. And how do we do it? We do it by protecting, learning, and preventing. With protecting, we protect patient safety and quality work through our PSO services. And learning, we help organizations learn best practices and improvement opportunities through publications and white papers, best practice sharing, our CPS safety snapshot, alerts and watches, quarterly newsletters, a compilation of studies and research, and a compilation of toolkits. And preventing. We help organizations prevent adverse event and patient harm by providing training in supportive cultures such as CUSP, which is Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety Program, Team Steps, Just Culture, and Second Victims. So let's start at the beginning of safety culture. Let's go back to 1999. This is when the IOM put out their initial report to Aris Human, which stated up to 98,000 people die each year in the U.S. due to medical error. This began the push for patient safety. And just this month, a report was released in the British Medical Journal, led by Dr. Martin Macquarie, a professor of surgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, in which medical errors were cited as the third leading cause of death in the United States behind only heart disease and cancer. What is scary is that this research was conducted only within hospital walls. To date, there is no data or research in healthcare arenas outside of hospital walls. And the other somewhat shocking statistic is that it is estimated that medical errors which cause severe harm to patients could be as high as 40 times the death rate. If we take 40 times that number, times the 250,000 patients who die due to medical errors, if we take 40 times that number, that puts the number of patients who suffer severe harm due to medical error at over 10 million. So what do we do about it? Well, the IOM did release a follow-up report entitled Crossing the Chasm, which laid out a plan for reducing errors. One concept that's report noted and highlighted 
is that quality problems occur typically not because of a failure of goodwill, knowledge, effort, or resources devoted to healthcare, but because of fundamental shortcomings in how healthcare is organized. Trying harder will not work. Changing systems of care will. This is why we focus so much right now on patient safety culture. This report, Crossing the Chasm, also set national goals for patient safety. It encouraged the profession to develop evidence-based knowledge and to do research to begin understanding of errors in healthcare. Most importantly, the IOM called on healthcare organizations and providers to commit to patient safety improvement by providing leadership invested in patient safety culture, implementing non-punitive systems for reporting and fixing errors in their organization, incorporating proven safety principles, and establishing interdisciplinary team efforts. This latest report in May of, of this year continues to support these measures, as does the Center for Patient Safety. In other high-risk industry, if a catastrophe happens, the root cause analysis and lessons learned are transparent and shared with everyone in the industry. In healthcare, historically, if an error occurs, it was kept hidden, those involved were told not to talk about it, and there was definitely no sharing of lessons learned. For healthcare to improve, there needs to be a system of sharing and transparency. The Free From Harm report is another report that continues along the line of recent research in patient safety. This report was released in January of this year by the National Patient Safety Foundation, or NPSF, and evaluated the progress of patient safety since the release of the IOM initial report. The NPSF found little improvement in the reduction of medical errors and emphasized that patient safety is actually a public health concern. In their updated report, some of the key findings are that patient harm remains unacceptably frequent, it has quality of life implications, and that patient harm adversely affects patients in all healthcare settings. This report also noted that quality improvement initiatives can advance only with an emphasis on culture, teamwork, patient engagement, and recommended a total systems approach. This type of approach incorporates a multitude of factors, but some of the most important factors include a continuous prioritization of safety culture by leadership, addressing safety across the entire care continuum. In fact, this report highlighted the need to expand patient safety outside of hospital walls because the majority of healthcare is actually provided outside the hospital. Another key factor is to support your healthcare workforce. And then lastly, the report recommends partnering with patients and families for the safest care. It recommends including them and helping them to become active and not passive participants in their own health care. So patient safety culture. I've been talking about it in the preceding slides, but what is it exactly? Patient safety culture is a concept that actually originated outside of health care in aviation, nuclear power, and other high-risk, high-consequence industries. Basically, patient safety culture alludes to how important an organization truly views patient safety and do their processes actually promote patient safety. An organization with a strong safety culture will commit to safety at all levels, from field staff to managers and executives. Key features will include acknowledgement of the high-risk nature of the services they provide and a determination to consistently achieve safe operations, a blame-free environment where individuals are able to report errors or near misses or unsafe conditions without fear of reprimand or punishment, encouragement of collaboration across ranks and disciplines to seek solutions to patient safety problems, and an organizational commitment of resources to address safety concerns. But where to start? A good place to start is by obtaining a baseline measurement of your organization's safety culture. That is where SOPS comes into play. SOPS, which stands for Survey on Patient Safety Culture, is a measurement tool that measures 11 overall dimensions within your organization. It is a great starting point for understanding where your staff is 
in regards to understanding patient safety and how their daily activities incorporate patient safety culture. By measuring first, an organization can obtain a baseline, identify one or two key areas to improve on, then implement frameworks that will assist with quality improvement processes, and these tools would include um, an item for reporting events, sharing and learning from them, which then would reduce errors and help an organization provide better and safer patient care. But culture is a never-ending process, so it's always a good idea to follow up the baseline measurement with a second survey 12 to 18 months after the first. This will help your organization visualize improvement in areas that they may have targeted for quality improvement and then identify other areas to focus on. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, has made available SOPs for hospitals, medical offices, nursing homes, pharmacies, and ASCs. The Center for Patient Safety administers these SOPs as services, and in addition, the Center has developed surveys for home health and EMS, which align with the ARC suite of surveys, and we are also the only organization which administers them. Here are the 11 dimensions that are measured from the 45 or so questions within the survey. As you see, some of these dimensions include areas such as perception of patient safety, communication openness, teamwork, response to mistakes, handoffs, and leadership support. These next couple of slides will show some examples of organizations that utilize the SOPS tool and how it helps them identify areas of improvement. The first organization is the SSM Health System. They own and operate 20 hospitals, more than 60 outpatient care sites, a pharmacy benefit company, a technology company, an insurance company, two nursing homes, they provide comprehensive home health care and hospice services, and they have two accountable care organizations in four states. Debbie Vossenkemper, their safety officer, stated that SOPS allowed them to identify one or two areas that needed improvement which could be used to drive change rather than trying to improve everything at once, which would have set them up for failure. And with using SOPS and the identification of areas of improvement, they were able to use quality improvement techniques to achieve incremental change that would set long-term goals and put processes into place that staff would not drop as they achieved their goals. Rather, the changes became integrated as part of their daily processes. SSM accomplished this by administering the survey across their organization. They had leadership engagement. The system CEO sent a letter to all staff stating that the patient safety survey and the employee partnership survey were closely aligned and equally important. All caregivers were encouraged to share their opinions by completing the survey. Leaders were expected to review the results and share improvements that had been made based on the staff's input from previous surveys. Feedback reports identified top improvement opportunities which allowed teams of frontline staff to develop action plans that aligned with the organization's strategic plan and goals. Results of the survey identified an opportunity among several hospitals that involved the handoff process between units especially between the emergency department and nursing floors. Quality improvement teams were put together to further study and improve this handoff process. And one of their hospitals, through the survey, identified an opportunity to increase its event reporting rate to un better understand where and why near events and near misses were occurring. Another organization is Cox Health. They are a health system across five campuses with 954 licensed beds. Cox Health spans 83 clinics and serves 25 counties across southwestern Missouri. Some of the comments by directors included how the survey was used as a tool to allow them to guide patient care departments and assist with focusing their priorities, and that the safety survey turned the invisible into the visible. Departments were able to see where they actually were and come together to make needed improvements. In this organization, all clinicians in the inpatient and outpatient settings, as well as the clinics and EMS department, were encouraged to participate. 
Senior leaders discussed the surveys with staff during their regular rounding and encouraged participation. Vice presidents and department leaders were responsible for discussing results at staff meetings and identifying opportunities for improvement. Departments using the Team Steps framework use the survey results to identify needs and focus education. Results of their SOP showed that the non-punitive response to error scored greater than the 90th percentile. This showed a high level of staff trust with management. It showed that patient safety culture had been nurtured as management was supportive and consistently improved processes when opportunities were identified. And one department went from zero survey areas that scored above the 90th percentile to seven survey areas which scored above the 90th percentile in their second survey. Patient safety is a continuous journey, and the survey is a tool to measure our progress and help us focus along the way. Doing the survey once is not enough. It needs to be routinely offered to see how we're doing. So here are some benefits of an organization which has a strong patient safety culture as a driver of care. An organization which has this has opportunities for organizational learning, not just processes that occur at the frontline level, but throughout the organization. They are willing to change policy and procedure if it's discovered that current policy and process don't promote patient safety. There is open communication. Staff won't be intimidated or fearful of admitting to errors or unsafe conditions. After all, how can an organization improve if staff doesn't feel safe communicating? Lastly is teamwork. An organization with strong patient safety culture will find its processes and policies promote teamwork and interdisciplinary collaboration, which leads to greater patient safety and decrease adverse events and a higher quality of care. But as with any culture change, there can be barriers to implementing a strong patient safety culture, such as a lack of leadership. And the senior executives may be unwilling to put patient safety culture as a priority. They may verbalize it's a priority, but the actions do not support their words. Another barrier is failure to update procedures and policies to ensure that daily activities are performed in a manner that prioritizes patient safety. Another barrier is a lack of knowledge or education among staff. If leaders don't provide their staff with updated research and knowledge in regards to best practices, how can they be providing high quality of care? Other barriers include lack of routine, lack of standardized processes and algorithms. This results in managers and staff constantly having to put out fires. So before I go any further, let's take a 15 second breather. In the beginning of the presentation, I asked all of you to think of areas where you thought patient safety could be improved within your organization. Now with some of the information that's been presented, type into the chat box just one area you would like to see your organization focus on as an area of improvement which would maybe help them improve patient safety. All right. So now that I've introduced you to some fundamental concepts of patient safety, let's take a look at how patient safety culture and QAPI can align. As many of you are aware, there is a drafted, updated conditions of participation with two major new items. The first one is the requirement of an infection control program that reflects current health care practices. It would require each health home health agency to maintain and document an infection control program to prevent and control infections and communicable diseases. The second item in the drafted COP is for each home health agency to develop, implement, and maintain an agency-wide data-driven quality assessment and performance improvement program, otherwise known as a QAPI program. So let's highlight first a few changes that have already occurred which led to the development of QAPI. I put up this five-pointed star here as I know the new home health compare data was just updated on April 20th and I know everyone is striving for that five-star rating. 
So with that, let's take a look at quality and the definition. A few years ago, CMS adopted the mission of the IOM, which defined quality as having the following properties. Effectiveness, which relates to providing care processes and achieving outcomes as supported by scientific evidence. Efficiency, which relates to maximizing the quality of a comparable unit of healthcare delivered or unit of health benefit achieved for a given unit of healthcare resources used. Equity, this relates to providing healthcare of equal quality to those who may differ in personal characteristics other than their clinical condition or preferences for care. Patient-centeredness, this relates to meeting patients' needs and preferences in providing education and support. Safety, which relates to actual or potential bodily harm. And lastly, timeliness, which relates to obtaining needed care while minimizing delays. So moving forward and taking a look at the QAPI program requirement, CMS listed five standards with which to develop your QAPI program. Executive responsibility, this pertains to your agency's governing body to assume responsibility for your QAPI program. They should define, implement, and maintain it. They should develop a culture that promotes and supports the QAPI program and ensure that this culture is nurtured, cultivated, and spread so that all employees will be engaged and can take ownership. Second is program scope. This pertains to being able to show measurable improvement and indicators for which there is evidence for improvement of health outcomes, such as reduction of hospitalizations and readmissions, improved safety, and increased quality of care for patients. And this would also include that QAPI is not about pointing out individual mistakes, but rather is about identifying gaps in systems and processes. Program data. This standard pertains to using quality indicator data, such as measures derived from OASIS, and identifying and prioritizing opportunities for improvement. This is where your benchmarking for your quality improvement initiative would come into play. You can use data from CASPER, Home Health Compare, HHQI, or if you utilize an electronic health record system, you may have data reports built in. Use this data to set goals and develop plans for improvement. Fourth was program activities. This standard pertains to focusing on problem areas, looking at the incidence, prevalence, and severity of problems. This would involve tracking and analyzing adverse events, utilizing a root cause analysis to identify causal factors, and implementing changes that will alleviate or improve performance in that specific area. And lastly, performance improvement projects. This standard pertains to annually putting into play a performance improvement project. And not only putting one into play, but also setting into play interventions and a timeline and measuring. So as, let, now that we've reviewed the standards of your QAPI program, let's look at how strong patient safety culture can be the foundation for a QAPI program. A strong patient safety culture has the following components. First off, leadership provides the example. They set the tone by their words, action, and support of a strong patient safety culture. They will make patient safety and quality a priority by setting up processes and policies which are integrated seamlessly into your daily workflow. A strong patient safety culture will include communication skills. It will set up standardized communication tools and maybe rounds or huddles to help with the coordination of care, which is definitely an area of interest lately. It will also look at processes, improvements, and ways to reduce adverse events. A strong safety culture includes tools such as root cause analysis that would help with reviewing adverse events and why they happened. An organization with a strong patient safety culture will find that it has improved teamwork, mainly due to the fact that it has removed any fear from speaking up about adverse events and unsafe condition. This then leads to improved processes. 
And lastly, an organization with a strong patient safety culture will find it has improved provider and patient safety, which goes into improved quality of care and also deve develops an environment where staff feels like the organization and leadership actually care about them. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. So one of the standards is executive responsibility, where leaders are to establish and sustain a safety culture. With implementing a culture based in patient safety, leaders set the example. So they should be in charge of putting it first. Culture change comes from the top down. If staff see that their leaders truly care and are actively engaged in setting a culture which revolves around patient safety, then they are more likely to stay engaged. Leaders set the tone for creating a climate of open communication and respect. They ensure that while professionals will be held accountable for unprofessional conduct, they will not be punished for human error. Another example is the standard of program activities. As stated before, this standard pertains to focusing on problem areas, looking at the incidence, prevalence, and severity of problems. Create a common set of safety metrics that truly reflect meaningful outcomes. Don't just throw out, say, starting as of this date, we're going to have zero falls. Well, it's always good to aim for zero falls. It isn't realistic to say we're shooting for zero falls without first measuring what your fall rate is and identifying factors associated with falls. So this standard <coughs> would go along with the patient safety culture item of tracking and analyzing adverse events, utilizing a root cause analysis to identify causal factors and implementing changes that will alleviate and improve performance in that specific area. And while tracking, monitoring, and analyzing your adverse events is important, it is also important to track your near misses and unsafe conditions. The near misses allow you to identify actions that a provider implemented that prevented the adverse event from occurring. And by identifying unsafe conditions, you can put into play barriers to prevent harm from coming to the patient or provider. Utilizing a root cause analysis to identify causal factors and provide timely feedback is extremely important. This allows for the development of tools and processes in real time to proactively manage potential hazards. So, Let's move on to what the culture problem is. I've highlighted a few areas of where a strong patient safety culture can help with QAPI, but let's look where there are problems. Historically, healthcare has been punitive. The prevailing thought has been rather to analyze an event and the conditions or factors contributing to that event Let's just eliminate the employee associated with that event. If you get rid of the employee, you get rid of the problem and the event won't happen again. Along with that cultural component, historically staff has been afraid to speak up if they make a mistake or have a near miss or there's an unsafe condition. Again, the fear is that the event or condition won't be addressed, but rather the person will be blamed. So then we come to how can you fix something if you don't know about it? In an environment where employees either don't speak up or are afraid to speak up, an issue isn't addressed until something drastic happens. It is usually only during an actual investigation of a major event, with the investigation usually being done by a third party, that an organizational culture problem that has maybe been present for years becomes visible. So here I'm going to highlight a few frameworks um, very briefly on how to address safety culture. The first one is Team Steps. It was developed by ARC and the DOD, and it's a teamwork system designed to improve communication and collaboration within your organization. The second one is just culture. This framework balances individual accountability and non-punitive response to error. It provides a framework for evaluating events and personnel issues, CUSP, which stands for Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety Program. This is a framework where the unit or team takes ownership of safety issues and proposes solutions. 
The frontline staff takes ownership here. It also teaches analysis skills to prevent safety issues from recurring. And the last one is geared towards your employees, second victims. It is where healthcare providers are involved in an unanticipated adverse patient event. This program provides trained peer responders who help second victims work through their feelings. I think there may be a polling question here on if you've worked with any of these frameworks before. So the first framework I'm going to highlight here is Team Steps, which stands for Team, Strategies, and Tools to Enhance Performance and Patient Safety. Team Steps is built upon an evidence-based framework composed of four teachable, learnable skills, communication, leadership, situation monitoring, and mutual support. This framework forms the core of the Team Steps model. The red arrows depict a two-way dynamic interplay between the four core skills and the team-related outcomes of enhanced knowledge, which pertain to a shared mental model, positive attitude, which includes mutual trust and a strong team orientation, and exceptional performance, which includes skills such as adaptability, accuracy, productivity, efficiency, and last, but certainly not least, safety. And <laughs> I was wondering what the results were of the polling. Hi, Tina. This is Misty Zyke. It looks like we have 56% um, of people who responded said that they've used Team Steps, and 44% of people who responded have used Just Culture. That is awesome. That is great. That's good to hear. Thank you. So going on into Just Culture, this is another framework developed by Outcome Ingenuity. It is a foundational program to manage risk across everything we do in high consequence industries. Just culture is, oops, I forgot to advance the slide. Sorry about that. There we go. Just culture is a model of balanced accountability, one that does not include any severity bias, professional bias, or bias towards systems or specific individuals. It is a model of shared accountability. When you set up a blame-free culture, it is at the expense of accountability. But yet when a punitive culture is set up, it is at the expense of learning and trust. So as you can see on this spectrum here, we have the punitive culture on one end of the spectrum where one failure is enough to justify dismissal and create the culture of fear of punishment. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the blame-free environment. It's not the fault of the individual, it's the system, which says to your employees, go ahead, do what you want, it's not your fault. There's no accountability there. Healthcare has historically somewhat vacillated between the two extremes. And what we need to do is find something in the middle, a system of accountability that best supports a system of values as applied to providers, managers, institutions, and regulators. That is what the JIST culture framework does. It sets up the system of reviewing behavior and actions as related to adverse events. Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety Program. This is a framework which started within hospital walls. It was designed by Johns Hopkins and is now available at the ARC website. It is also currently being looked at to try and modify to fit healthcare areas outside of the hospital walls. This framework identifies problem areas as seen through the frontline staff's eyes, not the manager or supervisor. So if this were modified for home health, it would be looking at and engaging your field staff. The improvement tools for this framework are designed for your busy bedside caregivers or field staff in that they are short and sweet. It allows the unit or team to drive their own quality and safety improvement. It also complements other improvement methods and organizational culture foundations such as Team Steps, Just Culture, and Six Sigma. In this framework though, senior executive involvement is extremely important. They need to be someone who will adopt the team, 
participate in rounds quarterly with the goal of talking with at least 60% of staff. They must attend monthly CUSP team meetings. Their engagement is crucial to assist with removing barriers, finding resources, keeping staff committed and engaged. The last program I'm going to talk about is Second Victims. This is one that is geared towards supporting the employee. Second Victims are healthcare providers who are involved in an unanticipated adverse patient event and a medical error and or patient-related injury and become victimized in the sense that the provider is traumatized by the event. Frequently, these individuals feel personally responsible for the patient outcome. A second victim program can help support your employees. It is much more than an EAP. It is a peer support program where those involved receive training to support their peers. The tragic case of Kimberly Hyatt is illustrative for this program. Ms. Hyatt was a nurse in the cardiac intensive care unit at Seattle Children's Hospital who mistakenly overdosed an eight-month-old patient with calcium chloride and the child died. Ms. Hyatt, a nurse of 24 years experience, immediately reported the event An investigation ensued. She suffered professionally and personally from the experience and six months after the event, she committed suicide. The Second Victims Program is designed to help and support employees who find themselves in this type of situation and also in other emotionally challenging situations. In my years in home care and hospice, I found that many times nurses and other providers have to deal with the death of a patient with whom they've been providing care for at least a year or longer. This can be devastating. And even though the provider knew that death was inevitable, they still question themselves, wondering if they could have done more to help the patient. This type of program can help support a staff member through the event and the grieving process. So let's take a look at the first three um, frameworks side by side. The first one we reviewed was Team Steps, which was an emphasis on the culture of teamwork and communication. It provides an acceptable structure and skills to voice concerns about a safety issue, and it promotes team understanding and efficiency. Then you have Just Culture, which focuses on a balance of individual accountability and non-punitive response to error. It provides a consistent framework for evaluating events and other personnel issues. And it has a philosophical approach from the organizational level down. And then lastly, CUSP. This is where the unit or clinic takes ownership of its own identified safety problems and proposes solutions to correct them and it teaches analysis skills to evaluate patient safety events and put measures in place to prevent them from happening again. So in summary, how can safety culture be a foundation for your QAPI program? A strong patient safety culture sets a culture which emphasizes patient safety also sets itself up for positive patient experience, collaboration between all healthcare members, improved coordination of care, improved communication, identification of potential errors before they cause harm, and standardized processes and less handling of each event as a separate event. So in conclusion, I'd like to close with a quote from Dr. Lucien Leap, who's a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health on his testimony before Congress on healthcare quality improvement. The single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. And I'd like to take, uh, give you all an opportunity for any questions. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation, Tina. And we do have uh, a few questions. And um, just so we have time to get 
to all of them, and we also have some HHQI resources that I'm going to go over. I'm just going to pick a few out um, since this one is actually pretty relevant to the audience because of the last slide. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind answering, and then uh, we'll, we'll see if time permits and we'll go on uh, to, to more. Um, and this question just basically says, uh, I think staff are afraid to report adverse events and, or unsafe conditions. I have seen that in the hospital and even in the in home health. As a nurse manager, is there any suggestions for me to show my staff that we want them to report events and near misses? And that's a tough one because it does address the culture, but it's got to have a starting point somewhere. And some of the best starting points are even with your first um, event or near miss, maybe that does come out in the open. If there's um, an infection that happens from a fully catheter, that would be the, the best opportunity, say, to sit down with the nurses involved at the care and just say, let's sit and do a root cause analysis and let's look at all of our processes that went into play. And using the words such as, this is a, uh, a learning opportunity, an educational opportunity, and not just bringing someone in to say, um, this happened, so it's going to be a write-up, but start with that type of uh, moment, seeking it to uh, sit down with your staff. That's always the best first step to take, is, is setting that example as a nurse leader. Wonderful. Um, we actually had two questions regarding uh, the um, patient or the um, SOPS, the SOPS tool, um, and uh, how do I get the SOPS tool or where can I find the survey on patient safety culture? We do provide that here, and we've actually administered the home health um, patient safety, uh, the survey on patient safety in, I believe it's four or five different states to agencies in four or five different states. So we do do that uh, tool here. And we can work right. with organizations to set it up so that it gets uh, all, all of your employees then um, have an opportunity to take it. All right, very good. Uh, this question just says, I'm located in the Northeast and I noticed my state was not highlighted as a state where the Center for Patient Safety serves. What do you suggest? Um, they can reach out to us and we're always willing to expand. Um, we're, we're not just limited to those 38 states. We are willing to uh, work with anyone across the United States. It's just right now we just happen to be with 38. All right, uh, the next one is actually just a comment. Uh, it, just, uh, uh, it just says, it all comes down to culture and looking at processes. So um, that, that comment is very appreciated um, and very true. It does. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, the other uh, question was just, I, want, uh, I just want others in my organization to listen to this webinar. Will it be available? Uh, Tina, I'll go ahead and answer that question. Um, it will be available, and um, in the chat, uh, we also noted that uh, a recording of today's webinar will be posted um, at www.homehealthquality.org. Org, um, org, and um, just go to the webinar tab and then under the safety tab. So that will be available for replay. And I will actually go over some other resources here in, in, in just a minute. But um, Tina, if you can just go ahead and, and introduce your safety team and then I'll finish up, I'll wrap up with some slides. Okay, um, this is a picture of our, our patient safety team. Um, we have Kathy Weyer, who is a lawyer and also has her MBA. Um, she also works with many of our long-term care facilities. Alex Christian is our interim executive director. Um, she's our fearless leader right now, and she has a lot, a ton of experience with the SOPS and doing, helping with the report and helping organizations um, understand their results. Uh, Eunice Halverson is an MA uh, with Patient Safety Specialist. She is um, Malcolm Baldridge Award winner, and she has, oh gosh, I think close to 30 years experience with quality in hospitals. Um, I am the project manager for home health, and I also work with some hospital uh, clinical initiatives. And then Lee Varner works with our EMS program and is the leader for the EMS project manager. And then Amy Vogelsmeyer, we don't have a picture of her. Oops, 
Sorry, guys. Um, she is um, a PhD with the University of Missouri, and she is our patient safety researcher and helps with analyzing. Um, and then I think the next slide has my contact information, should you want it. And you can feel free to email me at thomas at centerforpatientsafety.org. Um, our website is www.centerforpatientsafety.org. You can also email info at centerforpatientsafety.org. And our telephone number is toll free, 888-935-8272. Well, wonderful, um, Tina. Thank you again for such a wonderful presentation. And um, I would just like to encourage, even though it is the top of the hour, um, the chat and the Q&A feature is still open. And as I introduce some of the HHQI resources, uh, just feel free to keep those um, questions coming. So uh, like I said, I'm just going to go over some of our resources. All of these can easily be found under the Education tab um, for HHQI on our website. And the first thing we have is just that QAPI 101 fact sheet. Um, this is a very general fact sheet, uh, a lot of information here, uh, just from uh, the novice to the, to the uh, expert, uh, you can certainly get some information from there that's useful. We also have some performance improvement or the PIP tools uh, specific to cardiovascular health, hospitalization, medication management. These have been very popular tools um, for us, uh, so be sure and look at those. Uh, we have a QAPI Canvas tool. Now, all this is is just a tool that you can sit down with your staff, much like what Tina was suggesting, anywhere from your executive leadership to your um, specific teams, and look at your QAPI plan and, and look at where um, what, what needs work, what, um, what you already have in place, and it's something that can be downloaded off of our website and um, printed off for, for each and individual staff to even to fill out themselves and then come together and brainstorm and look at your QAPI program. Um, HHQI University. These have supplemental courses on the above topics, and of course CEUs are attached to those for nurses, and in some cases, social workers and physical therapists. Uh, the CMS is proposed conditions of participation. Those are also something to look at. I'm sure that many of you, most all of you on the phone call are familiar with the proposed COP, uh, but if you uh, need that link, that is also available. As for CE credits, uh, we have continuing education steps. So we get questions quite often about these, so I just wanted to go over these real briefly. Um, follow these steps to get your CE certificate for today. So you will need to register or log on to HHQI University um, off of our um, website. Uh, you will be automatically redirected to this website when you exit this webinar today. So you will see the green box there that's highlighted. You will need a, your username and password and to sign up and um, for the next steps after you get on um, to HHQI University, I just click on the Patient Safety Culture, a Foundation for a QAPI Program course, so you will have to enroll into the course, um, and that's under the little Apple icon. Uh, you will click My Account to launch the course. You will see this little box that says Enrollment Has Been Successful. Once you get to there, uh, click on the enter. It's a little green, it looks like a green brick, uh, the enter icon next to the course in the view column. And then you will click on the, the little green brick again uh, in the action column at, in lesson one. Now this is, this is something to remember. You need to review the e-learn content, which takes about 10 minutes. And then you will need to also um, make sure that you watch the patient safety culture webinar. Well, you, you've already watched the patient safety um, webinar, so um, you can skip that piece. And then you can take the post-test, um, and that's for 20 minutes. After completing the e-learn, uh, click on the icon again uh, in the action column item next to lesson two and complete the evaluation. After completing the evaluation, you can print your certificate from the My Account area. So finally, we are at the top of the hour. We want to mention uh, to look for more webinar presentations um, from the Center for Patient Safety in future, as a future part of patient safety series that we are hoping to plan for HHQI. 
Uh, it looks, again, like I said at the top of the hour, we'll go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. If we didn't have time to get to your question today, we will follow up with you after the session. And if you are viewing this as an archived recording online, you may submit your questions at any time by emailing us at hhqi at wvmi.org. Um, we will get back with you as soon as possible with that as well. For those of you watching live and you want to watch the replay, again, as I said, this session will be archived, but available online for your staff or whomever you would like to see uh, to view this by the end of today. Uh, just go to www.homehealthquality.org and click on the webinar tab and you will see a recording of today's session. With that, I just want to say thank you so much for joining, joining us today and a big thank you again to our keynote presenter, Tina Hilmes, for delivering this important information. Thanks for joining us and have a great day. Goodbye.